Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. I'm delighted to have you here discussing this topic, Poverty Proof, How to Train Your Brain for Wealth. And this is one that's very close to my heart. I speak on a number of different topics, some to do with innovation, some to do with corporate ideas, but this is one I feel very strongly about. Because when I grew up, my family and I went through not desperate poverty, but what you might call intermittent poverty. And intermittent poverty is this idea that you're generally doing okay, you're staying in a, in a middle-class neighborhood, but from time to time the bottom falls out and things get a little scary. And it's little things that give you away when you're going to a school in a moderately wealthy area, but you are the odd one out. For example, when you start, the end of your blazer is, uh, is down here somewhere, and that's day one at school. And a couple of years later, your blazer is up here because it's the same blazer and you've had to make it last. And there are other little things as well. The, um, the kids in my neighborhood, their parents would come and pick them up in these high-end Mercedes Benzes and BMWs, and they would waft up onto the pavement and open the door and expensive air would escape out into the world. And for us, it was nothing like that. My dad drove an old, beaten up, broken down Peugeot 504 station wagon. You remember those ones? Yeah, yeah they used to live forever, um, except when they would break down in front of the school pretty much every <laughs> afternoon. And some of it was comical, but some was a bit more serious. I can recall when I was about 12 years old, we went through a, a really bad patch. And I had a younger sister, Lart Lamaki. She was born when I was 12. And there were there was one winter where we had the power cut off and simply had to go to bed early every night because there was nothing we could do to get it reconnected. And our local church would deliver food baskets to our home and that kept us going. And I think the thing to me that is the most poignant and personal symbol of what poverty feels like is when these food baskets would arrive, they would always include a small box of baby formula for my little sister. I can remember being 12 years old and looking at that little box of formula for my infant sister with this bizarre mix of emotions. On the one hand, you are very grateful that someone is helping your family. And on the other hand, you are tremendously embarrassed that anyone has to. And that for me was the genesis of thinking about the thinking about wealth. And I've now spent some 30 years since then trying to untangle this mess of ideas and ideologies and systems of thinking that are our world of wealth and where we go wrong, where we go right, what works and what doesn't. And I have to admit to you, I'm a little terrified this morning. We have an esteemed economist in the room marking and checking my every word. But uh, <laughs> we had a chat earlier on and I, th I think we are of a similar mind in terms of how we view the world of wealth. And I'd love to chat with you again afterwards. So thank you very much for being here. I'm, I'm actually very honored. Do you remember early on in school, perhaps grade three, or if you're my age or older, you might have called it standard one. Mm -hmm. When you were learning English, the teacher would go to the front of the room and we would do these sort of comparative words. And she would say something like long. And the class would then say long, longer, longest. Do you remember doing that? Then she'd say strong, and we'd all say strong, stronger, strongest. And then she'd get a wicked glint in her eye. And we didn't know what was coming because this is the first time we'd experienced this. But then she would say dead. And the whole class would confidently say dead, deader, deadest. And then there'd be five seconds of pause while everyone goes, huh? And then some smart kid from the back of the room goes, no, you can't do that. And it all falls apart. And we learn our lesson. And what we're seeing here is there are two things wrong with that progression. It is grammatically incorrect. You can't say dead, dead, deadest. It is also logically incorrect. You can't be deader than dead. You are either dead or you are not dead. There are no levels of dead, dead, deadest. However, today we are going to play a mischievous little trick with logic. I'm going to, to ask you to entertain this idea. I think we can be grammatically incorrect, but logically correct. Today we are looking at ideas that I believe are wrong, wronger, and wrongest. And that's what we're after. And this for me has been a journey of trying to unravel these thoughts and ideologies and looking at how the world works. I am fundamentally interested in one thing. How do you help people? 
How do you lift people out of poverty? How do you make sure that people don't go to bed at night worrying about that image of a small box of baby formula? Because that's personal, it's hurtful, and it's scary. And there are solutions to these problems. What are they? What are the solutions we're being told that are not correct? And what kind of damage are they doing? Let's just take one example off the top of my head of a wrong, wronger, wrongest idea. Complete this phrase for me. And I'm, I'm not asking you whether you agree with it. I just want to know if you've heard it before. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. True or false? False. Okay. Utterly false. That one is not just wrong. It is wronger. Now, there's an implication that the poor are getting poorer because the rich are getting richer. And that one is the wrongest of all. So, let's disprove two ideas that I think are at the, the heart of this problem with wealth and our thought process around it. The first one is what we call the zero-sum game, or we might call it the finite pool fallacy. And it basically goes like this. Here's the simple version. There is an amount of money in the world, and we're looking at it, it's like a big pool of money. And our job is to take this pool of money and make sure everyone gets enough of it. There are several things wrong with that kind of thinking. The first and most obvious question is, <laughs> where did the pool of money come from? How was it generated in the first place? Now, the idea that if you give more to one, there is less for another. Here's how we utterly demolish that idea and, and why it isn't true. What's actually happening at the moment in terms of global wealth is the rich are getting richer at an astronomical pace. We have never seen wealth like this in the history of humanity before. But the poor are also getting richer. They are just getting richer at a slower pace. So if you had to put it onto a chart, you'd have the rich doing this, and you'd have the poor doing this. But they're both going up. If wealth was a finite, limited pool, that simply couldn't happen. If the rich were getting richer and taking from the rest, then the poor would have to be getting poorer. But it's not what's happening. In fact, over the last 10 years, we have seen what I think is an underappreciated miracle for our species. We have lifted one billion people out of poverty in the last 10 years. 2010 to 2020 was the most prosperous period our species has ever seen. That's phenomenal. Now, the problem is it's not happening everywhere. In South Africa, for example, we are bucking that trend. Why? What's going wrong? What is stopping us from enjoying this unheard of prosperity that is the case around the world? And maybe an even more interesting question is, why is no one talking about how good things are? Tune into any mainstream media and you're going to hear about how awful things are. They have never been better for us. So there's something fascinating going on here in this disconnect between the public discourse, the, the kind of fear-mongering that we're surrounded with and inundated with, versus what's actually happening, which is really, really good. And it's not just the wealth. There are other metrics as well. Did you know that infant mortality is the lowest it has ever been? In 18, 1800, it was something like 40% of kids didn't make it through their first year of life. 40%, that's just about half. We are now at the point where we are measuring a fraction, not 1%, a fraction of 1%. Our living standards are up, our health is up, our longevity is up. We are better fed than we have ever been before. We had all of these predictions over the course of the last century about how by 1970, when there are 4 billion of us, we're going to have eaten the planet into extinction. There are now going on 8 billion of us, and we are better fed than we have ever been. That's worth celebrating. There's something good happening here. So we're facing this tale of two narratives. And this is what fascinated me when I started writing this book, Poverty Proof. This is my second one on wealth. And I did a very quick internet search for solutions to poverty. And what I was fascinated to find was the first couple of pages all referenced expanding government and welfare programs. If we can just do more welfare, we'll solve poverty. If we can just have more social programs, more big government, if we can just take the pool and divide it up more. And you look for the things that say, well, how do we generate more pool for people? And you'll have a hard time finding them. And yet that's what actually works. 
So let's address the simple question underlying those ideas, the websites that we see, the ones that say grow the social programs. Does it help to give people more money? Just give them more money, do you solve poverty? It, it's a good question. What do you reckon? Okay. Why not? And the answer to that is actually quite interesting. We've, you've probably heard the idea that when, when we conduct studies on lottery winners, uh, how regularly they go from being mega wealthy right back to being poor within a year or two. It is so regular that it's pretty much a predictable thing. These are people who were given a large pile of money and for some reason it didn't stick, it didn't stay. So that's one version of the experiment. Another version of the experiment happened over the course of the last few hundred years while Europe was expanding into the world and trying its little empire building stunts. And one of them that became the leading empire, sort of 16th, 17th century, was Spain. Now Spain had an interesting, what we might call, business model. It was very simple. They went to the other side of the world, they took gold and they brought it back to their nation. They also didn't have a particularly entrepreneurial culture. At the time in Spain, your average family would tend to be serfs working for a feudal lord, half a step up above essentially slaves. And at the same time in Britain, there was a vastly different culture. They used to insult the culture in Britain by saying, a nation of shopkeepers. That was actually seen as an insult. These people work. They don't have people doing the work for them. Spanish culture was very proud. We sent our galleons off, we brought our gold back, and we lived lives of leisure. The degree to which you had to work was the degree to which you were a failure in life. Now again, by contrast, here comes Britain where they say, develop pride in your work, develop a work ethic. And they were a nation of tanners and shopkeepers and brewers and farmers and on and on and on. And what's happening there is you're starting to teach people how to develop the wealth rather than simply how to get it and have it. And those are two vastly different mindsets. As a result of that, Spain, having taken more gold than any other nation in all of human history, ended up fairly poor by European standards. Isn't that bizarre? As much money as you want, and it didn't help in the long term. Britain didn't go and loot gold from South America the way Spain did, but they grew their nation of shopkeepers. And as a result of that, they grew human capital. The ability to grow more money, to increase the value, and that made the world of difference. So my thinking around this whole idea of wealth is simply having the money is not the same thing as being wealthy. Being wealthy is knowing how to generate the money, how to create the value in the first place. And that presents us with some interesting questions in turn. What do we, what do we need to know about that? What do we do about it in the most practical terms? Well, and here I'm going to be flattering the group that I have in, in the room today. <laughs> But I wrote this book a year ago, so this is simply a coincidence. I asked the question, who's gone from poverty to wealth and how did they do it? And I found one demographic that was especially interesting, and that was Jewish immigrants into America. Now, all through recorded history, Jewish groups around the world have been the wealthiest people in any nation. There are fascinating reasons for that. When they emigrated into the United States, however, that particular group was unusually poor. And here's why. They came mostly from Russia that had just gone through a failed industrial revolution and had very kind, very expensive social policies in which they were going to take care of the poor, the results of which were quite disastrous. They also came from nations like Poland where they were especially targeted and persecuted as a group. So the average Jewish immigrant into the United States at around the same time that Jack and Rose were boarding the Titanic had an average of nine US dollars to their name in the universe. Of the immigrant groups going into the United States, they were the poorest immigrant group. That's out of everyone coming from all around the world. Within six decades, they were the richest demographic in America. Now I want you to just understand that one for a second. Not they were the richest demographic out of the immigrant groups, no, no. In the richest nation in the world, this group that was the poorest incoming group became the richest demographic in six decades. What on earth happened there and what can we learn from it? Well, there are several things that they did differently and they're fascinating. The first one is that the Jewish groups going into America were unusually entrepreneurial. They did not go there looking for jobs. 
they went there to establish their own businesses. By contrast, the Irish-American immigrants, who prospered, but not as much as the Jewish immigrants, tended to go into things like the police force, firefighting, and to get jobs on construction sites and so on. They've done very well over time, but not as well. So that's idea number one. They did not go looking for jobs, they started their own businesses. And idea number two, and this is, this is one that I absolutely love, is all through recorded history, Jews have outread everyone. They read more than anyone else on earth. And it started off as a religious imperative. Young Jewish males had to read the Torah. And even if you go back to antiquity, to Roman Greek times, in a world that was almost universally illiterate, illiteracy was almost unheard of among Jewish people. Now, that's, that is a fantastic idea. Where do we rank on that one? Well, I'm afraid we're not doing too well on that score. In South Africa, we have its eight out of ten kids who reach grade four are unable to read. And grade four is an important metric because up until grade four, you are supposed to learn to read. From grade four onwards, you are supposed to read to learn. So getting to grade four and being able to do that is a very, very big deal. How seriously do we take our literacy? Well, less than 1% of South Africans go into bookstores and buy books. For a guy who writes books, that's quite depressing. I'd like more people to do that. It would be very nice for me. But it would be very nice for the nation as well. It makes a very, very big difference. Now, maybe some of us are just too darn busy to read. We don't have the time. Do you have the Audible app on your phone? Now, if you haven't done this one yet, do yourself a favor. Download the app. It is free. You then pay for the books that you download. And if you do it on a contract, it is cheaper per unit. And you can listen to books anywhere you go in the bath, on the treadmill, at gym, while you're driving through traffic, particularly uninteresting lovemaking sessions, whatever the case might be. And you can vastly increase your intake of ideas and literature, and that is one of the biggest differentiators. So, one of the other things at play here in this demographic gr uh, group doing so well is the human value systems. There is a group called the Brookings Institute in the U.S., and they've asked the same question that I'm asking. They said, what do people need to do to get out of poverty? And they have a top two. And their top two answers are <laughs> mind-blowingly simple, yet unfortunately politically incorrect. And therefore, they are not spoken about in popular discourse. You're never going to hear them on the news. It doesn't sound great. Okay. Idea number one, what is the number one thing you can do to get out of poverty? Have a good work ethic. Work hard. That's it. It's fairly boring, it's fairly straightforward, and it doesn't make victims out of people. So it doesn't sound cool in news headlines. And number two, and this one is even less politically correct, don't have kids out of wedlock. You can't say that! <laughs> but what if it works? What if that information is important? What if it is life-changing to people? Well, it sounds very unkind. Okay, so we're going to allow poverty because we don't want to be unkind. What kind of BS is that? So I've come to believe that there are really two options here. We can go the politically correct route and sound nice, or we can actually help people. And I'm increasingly coming to believe that those two are mutually exclusive. You can do one or the other, not both. So value number one, work hard. Value number two, maintain a faithful family. Does it mean if you have kids out of wedlock that you can't be rich? No, not at all. It just means it's much harder. It is much harder. And of course, we create a monster by incentivizing people to have kids in order to get social grants. And what that does is it takes the number two thing you can do to head into poverty and ramps it up and helps us to do it on a national level. It's creating disaster. And it all sounds so kind. And that's the problem we're facing. So we have two different narratives and we have two different ideas about what actually gets people out of poverty. I then take this one step further and I say, once you've got these ideas in place, if you believe that it's uh, entirely up to you and essentially your choice about how you live, the decisions you make, and so forth, what can you now do to practically lift yourself up, make sure that you and your family do well over time? And there is a, what I think of as a master key and a built-in trap. And the master key comes to us from Robert Kiyosaki, who's the author of? Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yeah. And he gives us a very simple framework for how to understand if you're getting richer or poorer. 
And I love the simplicity of this. If more is coming in than going out, you are getting richer. If more is going out than coming in, you are getting poorer. Brutal audit as you sit right now, which is happening in your life. Actually, the more important question is, do you even know? Most of us don't. We have this vague sense of what's happening in the bank accounts in the background, but is more coming in than going out or is more going out than coming in? That's the measure, that's the key. And it sounds so simple, but it impacts so many things. I mean, for example, we're told property is your best investment. Go out there and buy a house and that's you know, how you assure your financial future. All right, well, if you go and you buy a house and you spend 30, 40 years paying it off, let me ask you a question. Is that putting money into your account or is it taking money out of your account? It's taking it out. It is not an asset, it's a liability. Now, by contrast, if you buy that property and you run it as a business, now suddenly more is coming in than going out. So it's not as simple as saying buying a home is a good financial investment. Well, no, not really. It's money out of your account. But if you can pay it off quickly or if you can turn it into a business, then maybe it is. But the whole key and the whole master key to that thing is that simple. More coming in than going out, getting richer. More going out than coming in, getting poorer. And that's, that's well worth understanding. Now, here's the big trap to this one, and it happens to everyone. You work your first job and you're, you're earning a small amount of money and you're living very frugally. You're doing all the right things. More is coming in than going out. Then you get the first raise or your business lands the first big deal or for some reason you come into some money. And what do we do? We spend a little bit more than we get. And it's called commensurate spending. Most people on earth fall prey to this one. As soon as your income goes up a little, we spend just a little bit more. Now, here's the problem with that one. If you're earning a small amount of money, let's say, for example, you are earning uh, 100,000 rand an annum. That's it. That's your income. And you're spending 105,000 rand per annum. Ooh, it's not good. You're going backwards. But the amounts are not big. Now let's ramp it up. Your business is earning 40 million rand per annum. You're spending 45 million rand per annum you have created a 5 million rand per annum poverty generating machine. This commensurate spending trap is a very, very big deal. So getting our heads around that idea is both simple but difficult to do. More coming in than going out, getting richer. More going out than coming in, getting poorer. Then in the book, I say, once you've got your head around that one, you, there are some choices that you can make that change things for you. There's a wonderful story that I quote from uh, Warren Ingram, who is a um, personal financial planner. And he tells this true story of a young lady, 26 years old, and based on her first job, by the age of 26, she has a million rand in her account. One million on the dot, clear, it's hers. She's a millionaire. And he says she made one choice that most people don't make. Instead of viewing her salary as a lifestyle support system, she viewed that salary as a wealth generating mechanism. In other words, she got on the right side of that equation, more coming in than going out. But she made that choice on purpose. And it wasn't a high level job. She, she had a university degree, which she had to pay back for her own studies. She bought a little car, which she then had to pay for herself. And by the age of 26, after paying back student debt and buying a small car, she was a millionaire. All she did was from the first salary that came in, she took half of it and put it away. 26 years old, million rand in the bank. Don't you wish someone had told you this when you were 20? I sure do. I didn't pull off that trick. I would have loved to have. That would have been great. You have to know this in advance and you have to have the discipline to do it but the discipline to do it for five or six years, and she was a millionaire. We have to get these ideas out, they're important. So here's the whole sort of unfolding belief system. It comes down to taking charge of your own financial wealth and understand that your work ethic, your reading habit, your maintenance of family are paramount. Then when you start getting money in, you treat that money as a wealth generating mechanism, not a lifestyle support system. And here's me lecturing myself about cars because that's my particular fatal weakness. After that, your goal becomes to raise your value. Why? We've only got a certain number of hours in a day. You can only work X number of hours. So what are we got to do? We've got to make those hours worth more money. I'd like to share with you an example of what I think is 
the ultimate earning to hours ratio. No one has ever pulled this off as well as this one guy. If you go to Forbes magazine and you flip to the list of wealthiest posthumous celebrity earners, there's a fancy way of saying famous rich dead guys. At numbers one and two, you're going to get names that you probably expect from the entertainment world. Can you guess them? What do you reckon? Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley, yes. Every year, he's at either one or two. What's the other one? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, yes. Okay. So every single year, Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley kind of change places for one and two. Who's number three? It is not a member of the Beatles. They come in later on in the list. It's a guy by the name of Charles M. Schultz. He is the cartoonist who drew peanuts. Now let me run you through his working day. Bearing in mind, this guy qualifies as the third wealthiest posthumous celebrity. Here's what he did. In the morning, his alarm would go off and he'd make a cup of coffee. He would sit down and eat a donut while he answered his mail. Then he'd spend one hour drawing a comic strip. We're done. That's it. That was his day. And he did that for 50 years. So how did he become so rich? Well, it wasn't about the amount of time he worked. It's about how many times he sold the end result. So you draw your little three panel comic strip and you send it off to 20,000 newspapers around the world. And each one of those newspapers pays you a small amount to publish your comic strip. And they do it every single day of the week. Then on the weekends, you draw the larger comic strip and that goes into the Sunday papers. And 10,000 newspapers around the world each pay you a small amount. Then we get to the end of the year and we take all of those comic strips drawn in that year, bind them together and turn them into a book. And 20,000 bookstores around the world all sell copies of that book and everyone pays you a small amount of money. You do that for 50 years and you add things like the television shows, the merchandise and so on, and you have a guy who out-earned two members of the Beatles. That is remarkable. One hour of work every day. So, I give you that as the extreme example of this, of raising your value. But that's the principle of the thing. We're saying there are only so many hours, how do you, how do you be worth more per hour? There are other answers to that question as well. And in the book I list, I think about 15 of them. I'll share three or four of them with you this morning. The one we most often think about is education. And that's not a bad way to go, but sometimes it's worth actually working out whether the amount you're spending in terms of time and money is going to be worth it in the long run. An MBA, for example, is renowned for being a home wrecker. It takes a great toll on you. It, it might not be worth it. If you're planning on starting your own business, so let's say, for example, you want to become a cartoonist, you're going to dedicate four years of that to art school. You then have to work out how much would I have earned if I'd had four years worth of growing the business instead. And it's not to say that you shouldn't get a varsity degree. I have one. I'm not sure it's made much of a difference to me financially, but I do have one. The question really is, is it worth it in my context? And sometimes the answer is no. Now, raising your education is not necessarily the same thing as getting a university degree. You can become educated in anything. The ubiquitous plumber often out earns most of us today, and that's education, but it's not a university degree. So there are different ways of doing this. Education, yes. University degree, maybe. Maybe, if it's right for you. And that's one way of raising your value. The other way of raising your value is to play the corporate promotions game and to do it on purpose. So in other words, to work your way up the ladder and do so by design rather than waiting for it to happen by default. Now, if you are looking to get promoted at work, what's the number one thing you can do? Do you currently know? I find this fascinating because most people work a corporate job and presumably the goal is to do well. And yet so few people think about how to do well in terms of getting promoted. Forbes magazine answered this question. They said based on their worldwide research, the number one thing you can do to get promoted more often and more quickly is to learn public speaking skills. Who here enjoys speaking in public? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no one. And that bears out anywhere around the world. You know, when they do surveys and they ask people, what is your number one fear? Death typically comes second. Public speaking tops the list. And what that teaches us is that at your average funeral, most people would rather be the guy in the box than the one <laughs> delivering the eulogy. 
<laughs> we have a massive fear of public speaking. And yet, if you do it and others don't, it helps you to get promoted. So there is a practical way of raising your value and getting ahead in the workplace. So it's very often the case, if you're trying to get promoted, that it's the soft skills, the human skills, the leadership, the volunteering, the initiative that is actually the way that you want to go. And quite often you'll find people who are highly technically qualified saying, why did that lady, why did that guy get promoted ahead of me? And the answer is because he stood up and led the meeting and that matters. That is a qualification, it's a form of value. So that's another way that you can do it. Now my favorite way of raising your value is what I talk about as a, a full-blown topic, and I have a couple of books on it, what I call expert positioning, which is becoming the top name in an industry on purpose. How do you become the Branson of business, the Clarkson of cars, the Nigella Lawson of food, the Oprah of TV, the Arnold Schwarzenegger of bodybuilding? How do you do that by design? And there are simple, powerful things you can do to make that happen on purpose. Basically, you've got to be seen in public often being both informative and entertaining. You take your knowledge, you take your personality, and you take it on a roadshow and show it to the world. Then you monetize it via things like public speaking, via things like training, coaching, writing books, creating online seminars, and so on and so forth. And the degree to which you are seen as the top leading name in that industry is the degree to which you prosper. And what I find fascinating about that is it changes so many of the working dynamics. When you are seen as an expert, you earn exponentially more. You find that the business and the deals come to you rather than you having to go to them. And you find that they build things around you. You're not wondering whether you'll get to speak at the big investment seminar. They're going, when are you free and we'll plan the seminar around you. It changes things. It also opens doors. If you are Elon Musk, you don't have to pay to go and attend a science summit. They ask if you will join them and they are honored to have you there. So everything changes in the, your relationship with the working world. And that's another way in which you can raise your value. Perhaps the most obvious one of all is, is just simply selling many things. And this is how the Rockefellers of the world became disproportionately wealthy. They sold lots of things to lots of people. I find Rockefeller's story particularly interesting. What do they often call those guys from that period of time? The robber barons. The robber barons. Because they exploited the poor in order to become rich. Let's take a look at some of their exploitation. Take John D. Rockefeller as an example. How did he get rich? He found a way to make paraffin cheaper for poor people. And poor people then voluntarily bought the paraffin because it did something quite useful for them. Generally, when the sun went down, they had to go to bed. But being able to burn paraffin gave them a few extra hours of productivity in the evenings. Suddenly, they could spend more time with their family, more time reading books, more time preparing dinner, and so forth. It bought them hours of the day. No one forced them to buy the paraffin. They voluntarily did it because it was good for them. They did it on such a scale because it was so cheap and so convenient that he became John D. Rockefeller. Oh, the evil bastard. Can you imagine? Then we get things like, well, you know, that much wealth taken out of the economy. Nonsense. It's that much wealth put back into the economy. He grew things, invested things, and created employment. He was also one of the, one of the greatest philanthropists ever to live. He built universities. He built um, hospitals. He uh, created funds for varsities and so forth, bursaries. And yet today we look at these people as the robber barons. Now, let's be fair. If you ask the question, were there bad people among them? Did they do unethical things? Yes. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Okay? As a category, were they good or bad for humanity? Exceptionally good. They lifted up all manner of things that we wouldn't have had without them, and they created employment all around the world. They are the beginning of what we're looking at, this upward surge in the wealth that humanity is enjoying today. Over the past 10 years, I mentioned, we've just lifted a billion people out of poverty, except in places that don't practice these open, unregulated, or not overly regulated, free market trading systems. Uh, the worst examples, post-colonial Africa. They had the option of going any direction they wanted, and sadly, they listened to radical French intellectuals. Radical French intellectuals who, from one of the wealthiest places on earth, said, you know what you really need? You need some Marxism. And unfortunately, because it sounded so progressive, it sounded so kindly, they agreed and did it, and it didn't work. 
Other countries around the world who simply said, all right, what a free market economy is doing, took on that template and went and became some of the wealthiest places on earth. None more so perhaps than Japan. A century ago, Japan was backwards. It was nothing. It was impoverished. They then looked at wealthy nations like Britain and America. They didn't copy the culture. They just copied the way of doing trade. They said, what works? And they have kept their culture wonderfully intact. But they're still doing the free trade thing, and it made them among the richest people on earth. Then we get the obvious objections where we hear people say, well, you know, Sweden is this wonderful socialist utopia. There are several problems with that idea. And I think this is something that we actually have to debunk publicly because it has the, the opportunity to do great harm to the next generation. Here's what actually happened to Sweden. They had 100 years of one of the least regulated markets on earth. In other words, business was more free in Sweden than anywhere else. At the end of that 100-year period, their golden age, they were the third wealthiest per capita group of human beings on earth. Then they decided to implement socialism, and they instantly dropped to the 33rd wealthiest group on earth. It did not make them richer, it made them poorer. They have been steadily dismantling the socialist system since then. And as a result of that, they are coming back. Sweden simply survived socialism because they were so rich at the time. They themselves have seen the joke and ask them if they're a socialist economy. They will say adamantly, no. People from Denmark uh, publicly go onto forums and say, please don't call us a, a socialist nation. We are not. What they tend to do these days is this kind of bizarre mix. They have one of the freest economies in the world, then they tax the living daylights out of their citizens. And it's kind of a social safety net as opposed to full-blown socialism. But like I say, they're busy repealing it themselves. And that's worth knowing. So, becoming wealthy then, raising your value, is ultimately about free trade and owning the sale. It's about raising good quality families who work hard, uh, read well, maintain faithful families, and work at raising their value. How do you know if you are getting it right in terms of becoming your own boss? Well, it's actually possible to get it wrong. Well, let's say, for example, your passion is cooking food. You are a chef. You are brilliant at what you do. You go, I'm going to be a business owner. So you start up a wonderful new restaurant. And then you wander into the kitchen and you start cooking meals as a chef in your own restaurant. You haven't created a business. You have created a job for yourself. It's very different. So how do you know if you're getting this one right? Well, it comes down to this one idea. Do you own the benefit of the sale? Every business sells something. And at the point where it sells, do you benefit from that or not? If the answer is no, if you're getting a salary, then you don't have a business. If the answer is yes, the more things we sell, the wealthier I get, then you are a business owner. And that's quite a key difference, a different way of looking at things. It doesn't mean that you have to do the selling yourself. It simply means that you personally benefit every time you sell. So how do we spare the next generation from some of these issues? I am increasingly fascinated by this idea of debunking what doesn't work and trying to teach what does. And it's an uphill battle because what works doesn't sound nice. It doesn't sound kind. It is not politically correct. It's so much easier to say welfare, welfare, aid, and so forth, um, and to vilify the rich. It's easy to do that, very easy. But unfortunately, it does damage to the next generation. I got a little two-year-old, he turns three in a week's time. Um, if you want to see the pictures, follow me on Facebook. I'm shameless. I, I post them all the time. <laughs> and I worry when I, I see articles shared around the world like the evils of capitalism and how we need to dismantle the system in order to save the earth. I think what kind of a world is he going to live in if that works? If that works, he's in trouble. He's in serious trouble. He's facing massive totalitarian tyranny because you have to have a, a government controlling everything. And he's facing potential poverty that he doesn't need to. Now, this matters to me. I, I'm, I'm emotionally invested in this one. And I reckon it boils down to what I call <laughs> a tale of two Thomases. Now, our economist in the room will know these Thomases. I think there is a, a good side to the force and there is a dark side of the force. Let's start with the dark side of the force. Do you know who we're looking at there? That is Thomas Piketty. 
I think this man wrote the most evil book of the last century, and I'm including the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> this is just the Communist Manifesto updated. I've read it. I've read the entire thing for my sins. And it all sounds very academic and very dense. And if you actually kind of dilute what he's saying out of it all, there are some frightening ideas in there. You've heard of this idea of the 1% and everybody else is so poor and it's the top 1%. That's this guy. That's his work. It comes out of his book, Capital in the 21st Century. Here's just one of his radical ideas. He says, because the 1% are hoarding all of the wealth, finite pool fallacy, anyone? It's not about generating. It's just about taking and distributing. Because the 1% are hoarding all of the wealth, what we need to do is abolish the opportunity to inherit wholesale. I want you to think about that for a second. You've got property, you've got a car, you've got some wealth. You die, you want your kid to have it. Thomas Piketty says, no. What's going to happen instead is the state takes everything. Your kid cannot have your family heirlooms. They can't have your old watch. They can't have things from your grandfather. They can't do it. It's illegal. Under an all-controlling government that takes everything and redistributes it thereby breaking the power of the 1%. There are so many errors and fallacies in this book that there is a whole genre of literature dedicated to, to debunking this guy. Now, here's the worrying part, though. Even though some of the books debunking his one have been New York Times number one bestsellers, walk into a bookstore and see if you can find them. You will find the original. You'll find Capital in the 21st Century. Why aren't there books next to it saying what's wrong with Capital in the 21st Century? You won't find them. You can go looking for them on Amazon. You can order them from overseas. You can download the audiobook, but you have to go looking, and I find that worrying. Now, there are several errors with this guy's book. Some of them are procedural. Um, the folks who have gone troweling through the numbers and trying to follow his maths and so on have gone, some of his numbers are just wrong, and some appear to be completely made up. So there are, there are flat out mathematical errors in his book. Then there are philosophical errors in the book. And that's perhaps the more interesting one. This is really just a modern rehashing of Marxism. His category errors are perhaps the worst crime of the book. For example, he says the middle class has stagnated over the last 50 years. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. Yeah, exploitative capitalism, the rich on top, the middle class, they're going nowhere. <laughs> What he doesn't tell you is it's not the same people in that category over time. The category stays the same because categories stay the same. It's a category. What's happened over those 50 years is some people who are very poor have come up into the middle class, and some people who are in the middle class have become very wealthy. Some have dropped from the 1% back down into the middle class. There's great dynamic movement there. But he points at a category and goes, look, the category hasn't changed. Of course it hasn't changed. You, you, you're delineating it yourself. But the human beings within that category have become more prosperous than the world has ever seen. And you're pretending that away. There's something sinister about that. It takes our thinking in a very dark direction that goes, well, then we need the government to step in and break this capitalist system. I go, no, we are going through the biggest miracle we've ever seen. Leave it alone. So that's Thomas Piketty. If you will take my word for it, and if, you, if I've still got you going with me at this point, I would like to recommend a different Thomas to you. This man, and this is a nerdy thing to say, uh, very few people say, my favorite economist with a straight face. I have a favorite economist. It's this guy over here, Thomas Sowell. Very award-winning, venerated man, um, speaks all around the world, basically on free market systems versus socialism versus capitalism. I love this man's brain. In the last while, I got uh, on my, my um, phone, I downloaded about eight of his audiobooks, and I listened to all of them in quick succession. Now, that may sound like a very boring thing to do. Boy, it's not. This is one very smart man, and he's exceptionally good at showing how things work over history. And what he does is he traces things like um, the culture from, from the, the uh, highlands in Scotland all the way into the United States, and he shows how that becomes gang culture today. I mean, it's mind-blowingly interesting stuff. He shows how belief systems impact our poverty, our prosperity, and so forth, and he does it in great storytelling fashion. You don't have to be an economist to follow him. I'm not. I love this man's brain. I'd keep it in a jar if I could. So... A final experiment. This has been a bit of a thinky morning, hasn't it? 
You still with me? Yeah. Alrighty. The headline I'm seeing more and more often, and I see this on social media all the time, and I myself try and actually put in a comment section what's wrong with it and pick apart the fallacies and so on, because I think it's important. It goes like this. Capitalism is destroying the world. We need a different system. All right. What system? What are we proposing there? Because that matters greatly. Capitalism has lifted almost everyone out of poverty. Poverty is becoming virtually extinct. We still have millions, we still even have hundreds of millions of people living in poverty. But out of 8 billion, we do not even have 1 billion living in poverty anymore. That is astonishingly good. So, let's talk about this idea of capitalism versus the environment and how we're destroying the world. Do I believe in taking care of the world? Yes, I do. I'm a Christian. In my Christian Bible, in the Torah, there are several injunctions to be good stewards of the world. Interestingly, there are even quite a lot about not being cruel to animals. And I mean, that's, that's come up a lot recently in, in the media. Um, if you're farming and so on, Bible says you can eat them, but you can't be cruel to them. You've got to be very humane. That's, I take that as, as my guidepost. So let's talk about this idea of capitalism versus the world. And I'm going to start with a little thought experiment that goes, would you press the red button? There's a button on the wall. If you press that button, all of humanity disappears. Just like that. It's Thanos from the Avengers movies. Yeah? You can do it. You can press that red button. If you do, Earth becomes a paradise. It becomes a god and all the animals roam free. No more human beings destroying uh, the environment. Would you do it? Would you press the red button? Okay. I'm glad to hear that. And that means we can proceed with this thought experiment because you are not a genocidal maniac. <laughs> Worse than the likes of, say, Stalin or Mao. Right. So if we agree that pressing the red button is actually an evil thing to do, then what we're saying is human beings have a right to exist. We're, there's something valuable about us. We're here. We get to be. Okay, good. Next trick. We need to eat. And there are eight billion of us. Not only do we need to eat, but we need to educate our children so that they know how to make things to eat. We need to have clothing. We need to move around. We need entertainment. We have multiple needs that we need met. At this point in history, our needs have never been as well met. That's where we are right now. So there are three basic ways you can meet those needs, and there are three ways only. The first is a barter system. I make a thing and you make a thing, and we swap our things. And that was good enough to get us up to the level of, say, villages. And it actually became clumsy un and unwieldy as soon as our villages became the beginnings of cities in ancient Sumeria. That's where barter pretty much started dying out. It couldn't go beyond that point. If your thought process is, well, we should go back to that, my answer is then we'd do nothing else. Because you would have to barter for the cup of coffee you're about to have, where you need to go, the clothes you're wearing, your next meal. Every single thing you do would be a transaction and a barter. We don't have the time. We would lose the opportunity to educate our children, entertain ourselves, make love, all of the things that make life interesting. Simply goes away. So that one's off the table. The other option that we have is a free market trade economy. It goes like this. I make a thing. You make a thing. I buy your thing if I want it, and you buy my thing if you want it. And if I don't want your thing, I don't buy it. And if I look at your thing and I want it, but it's too expensive, I find someone else who does it a bit cheaper. If I buy the cheap one and I go, but this is not as nice, then I pay more for the more expensive one, and so on and so forth. And that's free market capitalism. We almost make the mistake of thinking that it's a system. It's not. It's just freedom. It's all it is. It's everybody being able to do the thing they choose to do. If you want to buy it, you buy it. If you don't want to buy it, you don't buy it. Now, of course, we've introduced a lot of government regulation on that. And my take is the more we do so, the worse it gets. There are certain minimum things that we need. Uh, government as a necessary evil, but emphasis on the evil. Uh, you've got to have a few checks and balances in place. But beyond that, it starts doing damage. So that's number two. You can either barter or you can have free trade. Number three. Now, this is the one that is interestingly enjoying something of a resurgence among the youth, and it's a radical idea. It is central control. Now, central control takes two forms, and two forms only. You either get the old-fashioned feudal system, which goes, I am the lord of a manor, I own you, and you will do what I say, 
or you get the modern equivalent, which is, I am your government, I own you, and you will do what I say. And what they then do is this. They say, you guys are going to work in a factory. Now, you have no choice. You are told to work in a factory by an authority. And you guys are going to go and work on a farm. And you have no choice because the government is in control and tells you to do so. Then the government says, well, I'm going to take everything from the factory and I'm going to give some to you. I'm going to take everything from the farm and I'm going to give some to you. And that's called communism. And we tried it and it was the least efficient system we have ever tried. Its death rate is astronomical. If you combine starvation under communism and the people who were murdered by their own government, in the last hundred years, it's over a hundred million dead by starvation or genocide under that system. Yet that's what people are increasingly proposing. Strong central government tyranny telling us what to do. Get rid of capitalism because, oh, evil exploitative capitalism. We need a better system. You've only got three options. Now, the good news is free market capitalism, while it does do damage to the environment, is doing less so over time. We're getting better at this. In fact, over the last 10 years, our efficiency numbers and metrics have been off the charts. Last 10 years, we've lifted a billion people out of poverty. Last 10 years, our mortality rates have gone down. Our needs are met more than they have ever been before. Did you know even our CO2 emissions are going down? Except in strong, centrally planned communist economies like China, where they're going up. So when you see a headline that says capitalism is evil, we need to dismantle it in order to save the world, the exact opposite is true. The reason for that is that our system, our free market system, tends toward greater efficiency. 50 years ago, if you wanted a camera and a calculator and a telephone, these were all separate devices. Now you can have them all together, put them in your pocket, and off you go. You've even got a little navigation system in your pocket. It's tending toward efficiency, not toward waste. We're getting better at it. So, if, you'd won't, if you don't want to press the red button, if you are not a genocidal maniac, and if you care about the planet, this is the best way forward. Is it perfect yet? Are we there yet? No. Is it heading in the right direction? Yes, in a hurry and getting exponentially better over time. And this is good news and we need to be sharing it because it's not the common dialogue. So, those are some thoughts on differences in thinking between people who get stuck on trajectories that go up or down. It's in our hands to a greater extent than it is in the government's hands. I've, I'm thoroughly convinced that the degree to which we think it is a government solvable problem is the degree to which we head downhill into poverty. The top two metrics for heading upward, work ethic, faithful maintenance of a family. After that, raise your value, and if you can become the boss of your own business, that's the ideal way to go. May you be richly blessed as you train your brain for wealth and become poverty-proof. Thank you. Thank you.